we want to welcome you to Lakeview Church. How many are excited to be here today? Amen. We're excited to have you. Glad you're here. Uh, let me just share just a couple of things with you before we get started on our second installment of this series. Uh, it's the God of Miracles, and today's title is titled The Purpose of Miracles. And so we're going to be talking about what are the purpose of miracles. But before we do, if you're our guest today, we want to welcome you. Let's give our guests just a big hand. Amen. Thank you. And if you're a guest today, in your seat pocket in front of you, you're going to find a connection card. And if you'll just take that connection card, fill it out, that's the only thing that we ask you to put in these offering boxes back here. Uh, but also, not only do we want to get a record of those that are our guests today, but if you would happen to have a prayer request, uh, please use the card to fill out prayer requests. We pray over those every Saturday morning for sure. During the week, we pray for them, but also on Saturday morning, uh, our prayer group, and you are invited to that uh, prayer small group each Saturday morning at 9 a.m. We meet right here. We had a great group this last week, and I'm telling you, there is power in prayer. God wants to, I, I, I'm, I'm telling you what, the Bible said the eyes of the Lord look to and fro. He's looking for someone that he can make himself strong on their behalf. How many would raise your hand and say, well, right here, you don't have to look any further. <clears throat> and so he's wanting to, to partner with us to bring about <laughs> the miraculous in our life and in the lives of others. And so please join us uh, on Saturday morning at 9 a.m. But anyway, connection cards, again, fill those out. Also, uh, there are four ways to give here at Lakeview Church. They're on your screen, but you can use the the, the box is back here at the back of the sanctuary just to deposit your, your giving if you're giving cash or a check. If you want to give online, you can give at lakeviewpeople.com slash give. The text, to, uh, the text to give number is on the screen. You can use that number to give. Or you can download the Lakeview app. If you download the Lakeview app, you can give through the app as well. Let me tell you about two great things we have coming up. How many can, can you already believe that Easter is just right around the corner? I mean, time flies when you're having fun, doesn't it? Amen. And, but uh, the day before Easter, both here in Iowa Park and also in Vernon, we're going to be having an Easter carnival. The Easter carnival here will be uh, here at the church, the one in Vernon will be at the Wilbarger Auditorium. Both of them will start at 11 a.m. and they'll go from 11 a.m. to 1. We have a lot of things planned, uh, about 10,000 uh, eggs that we're going to be giving out at both places. And so we want to encourage you uh, to get involved if you want to be a sponsor or help in that. And when I say sponsor, what I mean is to host the game. We have the games. We just need some people to run the games. And so if you want to get involved that way, you can use your connection card. Say, I want to get involved to help at Easter. You can just deposit that in there. We'll be getting in contact with you. Or you can let Pastor Clint know or myself know that you want to get involved, we want you to be involved on that day. Amen. And then the next day is Easter. And Easter is a great time. Amen. It's an awesome time to invite your friends to church. Why? Because it's, it's in the minds of people. They're thinking about Jesus and they're thinking about what he's done for them. And it's a good opportunity. This message on Easter is entitled, When Only a Miracle Will Do. How many know there are times in our life the only thing that we can believe in is a miracle? And that's what it was when we were lost in our sins and trespasses. When we were lost, there was no hope for us. Can you, can you just grasp that for a minute? When we were lost in our sins and trespasses, no hope. We were without hope, the Bible says, in this world. No hope in the world. But God, who is rich in mercy. He's rich in mercy. And he loves us. And he sent his son to die for us. And that death, burial, and resurrection was a miracle. And that miracle is what we needed. Amen. And so Pastor Daniel will be preaching that Sunday. Also on that Sunday, we'll have new service times on that Sunday. I'm not going to tell you what they are because I don't want you to come that time next week. Amen. Uh, but, but as we get closer, we will tell you those, uh, those service times. Right now, let's do something really great. There are some folks watching with us online. Can you welcome all the folks online? Let's give them a big hand. We're glad that you're with us today. And uh, if you ever get a chance, please come and, and enjoy service live with us. We'd love to have you. Amen. So God of miracles, 
What in the world are miracles for? What's the purpose of miracles? Well, in Psalm 77, verse 14, I want you to hear this because this is our theme scripture for this series of messages. The theme scripture says this, you, the psalmist said, you are the God of miracles. He was talking to God himself. And here's one thing we need to, to learn from this is that you and I can talk to God. You can talk to God. And he's listening. And here's what the psalmist said. He said, you are the God of miracles and wonders. You still demonstrate your awesome power. We talked about this, uh, that, that in worship, in worship, if you don't know how to worship, you can take a psalm and you can begin to, to just parrot what the psalmist said. Just say what he said. Because you can look in your prayer time and you can look up to heaven and you can say, God, you're the God of miracles. You're the God of wonder. You're the God who demonstrates your awesome power in my life. And I give you praise for that today. I thank you that you demonstrate your awesome power in the lives of my children. I'm thankful that you demonstrate your awesome power in the lives of my grandchildren. I'm so grateful that you're a God of awesome power and how many know God wants to show up because God will show up let me tell you what God's like when you worship God as your deliverer he becomes your deliverer when you worship him for who he says he is he becomes that to you and you will see his manifestation and demonstration of power in your life in those areas and so this is our key scripture you are the God of miracles and of wonders and so our one desire in the church is to know the God of miracles. How many know that um, the vision of Lakeview Church is that people would know God, find freedom, right? Discover their purpose and make a difference in the life of somebody else. But the first thing that we want you to do is to know God. And to know God, you have to know him and know his character. And to know that he is a God that performs and does miracles. Now, one thing about that is a lot of times people will seek God for the miracles. They'll seek him for the miracles. They'll seek him for the giftings. They'll seek him for his works. But why do we seek him? We have to seek just him. Seek just him. See, we cannot seek the spectacular at the expense of truly knowing God and his character. Please listen to me. When you seek God, he becomes for you what you need. That's really, that, that has to be something we, we lay hold of. There's freedom in Christ. When we seek him, that freedom comes. But some people just seek him for the supernatural. They seek him for the spectacular. How many know Jesus when he came out of the wilderness in Luke chapter 4? He came out of the wilderness. The first thing the devil did is he tried to tempt him. Three different temptations. Three different times the devil tempted him. And every one of the things he tempted him with was something very spectacular. And here's what the Bible says. Jesus answered and he said, It is written. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. See, we're to worship him only. We're to seek him only. We're to know him only. And when you know the God of miracles, miracles come. Can you say amen? So seeking the spectacular then causes us to actually miss a supernatural God. How many believe our God's a supernatural God? Our, our, um, our salvation is a supernatural salvation. How many believe you're going to go to heaven? Heaven's a supernatural place. So we as the church, we believe in the supernatural, amen? We believe that God is more than what we see with our eyes, touch with our hands, taste with our, our, our mouth. He's more than that. We, we connect with him spirit to spirit. Now let me share something with you about God. God gives gifts. And I want to talk to you a little bit about gifts for a minute. God gives gifts. But why does he give gifts? God gives gifts because he has purpose. God never does anything apart from purpose. In Romans chapter 12 verse 6, the Bible says this. In his action of grace, I added that in his action, because in studying this week, we found that his grace here is he's acting in his grace. He's acting in his grace. And when he acts in his grace, God has given us different gifts 
for doing certain things well. Let me share something with you. Uh, have you ever had someone tell you, oh, you've just got the most beautiful blue eyes. Where did you get those blue eyes? Or where did you get that blonde hair? Or where did you, you know, you're so tall and dark and handsome. Where did you get that, brother? Hallelujah. Well, we know they got it from where? Their parents, right? We say, where'd you get that blue eye? Well, I got the blue eyes from my parents. I got the blonde hair from my parents. I got this physique from my dad. Amen. Come on, somebody. I have him to thank for that. It's the same thing. In his action of grace, God has given us different gifts. The word gifts here is the same Greek word as grace when God's acting in his action of grace. And we could better read it this way. Leave that up for me. Thank you. In his grace, God has given us different graces. What that means is he's given us different parts of himself. Just like if, you, if your parents have brown eyes, sometimes the kids have brown eyes or hair or, or, or on and on. You get that from your parents. Well, we get the grace that we've got from our God. God gives us graces. And not all those graces are the same, and not all those graces are the full grace that he could give us. The Bible says this of Jesus, that Jesus had the Spirit without measure. That meant that Jesus had all the grace of God without measure. He was completely God. The Bible tells us in Hebrews, he was the express image of God. If you saw Jesus, you saw God. That's why last week when we were talking about the glory of God, it's seeing the glory of God in the face of Jesus because all of the glory glory of God is resident in him. And that's awesome that we understand that that's who God is. And so why do we need to know this, that God gives gifts? Because in his action of grace, or he has given us different graces. What are those graces? They're miraculous endowments or faculties. Miraculous endowments or faculties. So you might say, well, again, you have blue eyes. Your parents have blue eyes. That's not so miraculous. That's kind of natural, right? But God can do the supernatural, and God's given you supernatural giftings. That, that takes on a whole new meaning. And what are those supernatural giftings for? For doing certain things well. So God has gifted you to do certain things well. So let me say this about you and about me. We have gifts. You have gifts. And the gifts that are on the inside of you, God put them on the inside of you so that you could do things well. And how many know there's some things that one person does real well that another person, it's not only that they don't do it well, they don't even care about doing it well. They're like, I don't even do that. You know what I mean? I mean, some people have a, a, a bent towards one area and they're just really excited when, when you turn the music on, I bet you old Hannah's foot just starts tapping, right? Why? Because she's a music person, right? But if you are not a music person, the music comes on, you're like, I got to get out of here. It's too loud in here. You know what I'm talking about? Because that's not your gifting. It doesn't mean we can't worship God together, but, but, but I want, I'm making a point here. And so God gives gifts. And then so then the Bible says God gives gifts. And then number two, the Holy Spirit distributes those gifts. In 1 Corinthians 12, 11, the Bible says this. It is the one and only Spirit, capital S, designates the Holy Spirit. So it is the one and only Holy Spirit who distributes all these gifts or all these graces. He alone, hear me, He alone decides which gift each person should have. So listen, sometimes we have giftings and we look at other people and we say, well, gosh, I wish I had their gift. How many have ever said that? I know I'm gifted a certain way, but I'd rather have their gift. Well, what we have to do is we have to believe that those gifts that we have, God gave them to us on purpose. And not only on purpose, but for purpose. And that if we don't operate in our gift, the body of Christ is lacking. And so God wants to work through you, through the gift that he gave you, distributed by the Holy Spirit. And these gifts or callings or offices, and if you want to know about the offices, you can look in Ephesians chapter 4. The Bible says this in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Uh, God, um, God has given gifts to men. 
And those gifts are the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor and teacher. They're for the perfecting of the faith, faith that we, we might all come together and do the work of the ministry. And so they have a purpose, those offices. But then there are other giftings. And those giftings you can find in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. You can find these giftings that we can walk in. And these gifts, callings, and offices are conferred by God, but distributed by the Holy Spirit alone. Remember when Jesus said this, he said, The works that I do shall you do also. And greater works because I go to the Father. How many remember Jesus said that? Well, what happened when he went to the Father? Well, when he went to the Father, the Bible says when he sat down on the right hand of the Father, he gave the Holy Spirit to man. And the Holy Spirit was poured out. And when the Holy Spirit was poured out on man, he was poured out with the, um, with the assignment to distribute gifts to the body of Christ. So Jesus said, the works that I do shall you do also, and greater works than I go, that, uh, greater works, because I go to the Father. Let's talk about that just a second. First of all, the works that I do. Well, all those disciples had been watching Jesus do all kinds of miraculous works, hadn't they? I mean, they were there when he turned the water into wine. They were there when he fed the 5,000. They were there when he said uh, uh, to, the, to the two blind men to come forward. He, he was there when the woman with the issue of blood touched. They were all there all this time. They saw all the miracles. They saw the miracle of Jairus' daughter raised from the dead. They saw all these miracles. And then Jesus looked at them and he said, The works that I do shall you do also and greater works because I go to the Father. You know what he's saying? Look at me. He's saying, The works that I do shall you do also. Each one of us can do the works that Jesus did based on the giftings that the Holy Spirit gave us. Now, that's so important for us to understand. I mean, it, it takes a minute to allow that really to sink into your thinking and actually become a part of what you really believe. Because so for so long, we thought, well, the man of God does miracles or Jesus does miracles, but I can't do miracles. But see, if we think that we can't do it, guess what? We can't. How many remember when the Bible said that Jesus went into his own hometown, but there he could do no mighty work? Why could he do no mighty work in his own hometown? Because they couldn't look past his humanity to see what was on the inside of him. And when they couldn't see what God had put in him and, and, and that he was all God, they couldn't receive him as that because they knew him as Jesus, the carpenter's son. And so when they knew him as Jesus, the carpenter's son, they couldn't receive from him. And all the time, what we do is we look at one another as, oh, that's just Joe, the church member. Or that's just the guy I sit next to in the pew. What's going to happen when he prays for me? He's not Jesus. But here's the thing. God's gifted us. And the Holy Spirit is on the inside of us. And if we can look past the outward to the inward, we can receive from what God is wanting to give. Amen? Or we can act out of what God has put on the inside of us to benefit somebody else. So it's so important. So we said this, God gives gifts. The Holy Spirit distributes gifts. Number three, the purpose of these gifts. What is the purpose? The purpose of the gifts that God gives is to confirm the word of God. To confirm the word of God. I always say it this way. How many know who, uh, um, I can't think of his name all of a sudden. Preach the evangelist. Uh, da, 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 da. Billy Graham, thank you very much. You were here in the first service. Thank you, sister. Uh, Billy Graham. When Billy Graham preaches, what happens? Or when he preached, what would happen? People got saved. Why? Because he was gifted as an evangelist to get people saved. So when he would preach, he would preach salvation messages. And when he would preach salvation messages, the power of God was present to see people get saved. 
Back in the 50s, in the 60s, there was a movement called the healing revival or the revival of the healing power of God. It, it never went away. It was just a revival of it because we had thought it went away. But it never went away and it still exists today. But in those days, you had healing, healing revivalists and they would go through and they would preach that God was a healer. Men like Oral Roberts and, and uh, uh, even, even T.L. Osborne was this type of a man that would preach these things. You've heard of Oral Roberts. You've heard of A.A.L. and some of these old men of God, Jack Coe, right from Dallas, Texas. Uh, these guys would hold these tent revivals and, and preach about the healing power of God. And then all of a sudden, people would start getting healed. And guess what? They were preaching healing. People would get healed. Once they get healed, you know what would happen? They would accept Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Why? Because those miracles were for a purpose. They were to confirm the Word of God. Every miracle of God confirms his word. How do we know that? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 4, And God confirmed the message. God confirms the message by giving signs and wonders, various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit whenever he chooses. And so signs, wonders, and miracles were never designed just to stand alone. They were not something just to be sought after alone. <clears throat> Uh, but they were given to reinforce the truth of God's word. Now, how many are observers of the, of the miracles of Jesus? How many have read the Gospels? And, and, and do you get excited reading those? We're, we're observers of the miracles of Jesus. But not only are we to observe the miracles, we're to learn from his miracles. We've got something to learn. So when it comes to miracles, one thing we need to know is that it's when God chooses what God chooses, and who God chooses to use. See, the writer of the book of Hebrews was just confirming what Jesus had already given to us in Mark chapter 16. Let's look at Mark chapter 16. It's there in your notes. The Bible says this in Mark chapter 16, beginning in verse 15. It says, and then he, Jesus, he, Jesus, told them. So these are the words of Jesus. How many think the words of Jesus are important? Well, I do. And so then he, Jesus, told them, here's what he told them. Now, <clears throat> we say this is what he told them, but he didn't tell them as much as he's telling us. Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. How many know that's our mission? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, what... See, I don't want you to think, when you say go into all the world, I don't want you to think geographically. Don't think geographically. Just for a minute. You can. It's all right. But just for a minute, don't think geographically. Think about you. Who's in your world? Who's in your world? You know, some people's world... They're involved in people that all, you know, they love horses. They love riding horses. They love, uh, you know, doing whatever you do with cattle. I don't even know what you do with it. But whatever you do with cows and cattle, they love doing that kind of stuff. Can you tell I'm not that person? So I don't have very many people like that in my world. If they do, they just happen to, they kind of got out of the fence. You know what I'm saying? Came into my world. But then I've got people in my world you know, they like sports. I'm a, I'm a real avid sports fan. People I, that I get along with like sports. People that I get along with, they love Jesus. You know what I'm saying? And th those are the people that I, I get along with or are or, or, or in my world. But then there's people in my world that don't love Jesus. People I do business with. People that I, 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 I you know, I meet out in, the, in public. And, and the thing about that is, is that that becomes my world. And I want to embrace those opportunities to meet new people. I've always said it this way. I don't, I don't really need new friends, but I do need new acquaintances. I need to meet other people because there's things in their life that are good for me, but there's something in me that is awesome for them. Do you know how I know that? It's because the Holy Spirit's on the inside of me. And he's gifted me in certain areas. And so what is the purpose? It's to confirm the word. And so he said this, go into all the world and preach the gospel, the good news to everyone, anyone, say anyone, anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. So what that means is anyone you talk to about the gospel, if they'll believe it, they can be, they can be saved, anyone. And so who's in your world? 
And so anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. And then notice what he said. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. How many are believers in here? So this is what will accompany you if you're a believer. Come on. Let's not get nervous. Let's see what's going to accompany us. That they will cast out demons in my name. Come on with somebody. If you can't even see it, it'll never happen. It's when we begin to see it and we begin to have expectation about it is that when we can begin to deal with it and have it happen in our life. Why? Because some people are bound by demons and they need to be uh, loosed. And God wants to use you, but if you don't think he's even willing to use you or that he can even use you, you'll never see that. But if you believe this passage of scripture that says that you will cast out demons in my name, that you will speak in new languages or new tongues, that you will be able to handle snakes with safety. All that means, it's not, it's not snake handling ministry. You understand what I'm saying? It, it's talking about if something happens and you happen on a snake, you can shake that thing off back into the fire just like Paul and nothing by any means shall hurt you. He said they'll drink anything poisonous and it won't hurt them. If you're out doing what God's called you to do, the devil's going to try to stop you. But if he tries to stop you, no matter what means he tries to use to stop you, if you're a believer, he can't stop you. He said they will take their place and, and, and they will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. And when the Lord Jesus had finished talking with them, he was taken up into heaven and sat down at the place of honor at God's right hand. And again, what did I say that happened when he sat down at the right hand? In the book of Acts, it tells us that he poured out the Holy Spirit. He sent us the Holy Spirit. Not only to be on us, but to be in us. And the disciples then, what did they do when Jesus, when Jesus said, go into all the world? He went to heaven. They went on into all the world. It said, and the disciples went everywhere and preached. So they did the first part. They went everywhere and preached. And then what happened? The Lord worked through them, confirming what they said by many miraculous signs. What's the purpose of miracles? To confirm the preaching of the word. If we're not seeing miracles, it could be because we're not preaching the word. Man, that went over real big. It's true. We want to see miracles, but we want you to do them. You do the miracle, we'll watch. Huh? And that's not what Jesus signed us up for. He said, you believe, you preach, you'll see the miracles. Well, I'm not a preacher. Oh, yeah, you are. Because a preacher proclaims the good news. That's all he does. Proclaims the good news. We're all preachers in that respect. We all have that charge. Jesus said to all of them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. And so what is a miracle? What is a miracle? Because miraculous signs are going to follow. What's a miracle? How do we know if a miraculous sign is followed? A miracle is an extraordinary, an extraordinary event manifesting as divine intervention in human affairs. That's what a miracle is. You guys see that, right? Can you put that on the screen for me? Just the, the, a miracle? There you go. A miracle is an extraordinary event manifesting as divine intervention in human affairs. When do they take place? When we preach the gospel. Let me say it this way. Uh, 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 let me, I, I want to say it this way. Jesus, how many remember when Jesus let, uh, um, uh, they, the guys let the man down through the tiled roof, down into the presence of Jesus, while Jesus was talking to the rulers of the law. Notice what the Bible said. Jesus is talking to the rulers of the law, and the Bible said that the power of God was present to heal them, but none of them were healed. So you know what that means? The power can be there. The miraculous can be there, but somebody's not receiving it, right? And it wasn't until they dropped him down through there that Jesus looked at him and said, your sins are forgiven you. And all the religious leaders just about freaked out. What do you mean your sins are forgiven? 
But he said, that you might know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. I command you to get up and take your bed and walk. And the guy just stood up and walked. What was healing? It was a confirmation. Healing, the healing power of God is a confirmation of God's will to save you. That's all it is. And God not only wants to save you spirit, but he wants to save you whole spirit, soul, and body. And so a miracle is an extraordinary event manifesting as divine intervention in human affairs. So then miracles are a direct, immediate, sovereign, and a supernatural act of God. See, the four Gospels include all kinds of miracles. We said we are all observers of those miracles. We like to read the Gospels and see all the works that Jesus did. And that being said, it's noteworthy that this miracle, the feeding of the 5,000, and that's what we're going to talk about. The feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle in, uh, from the public ministry of Jesus besides the resurrection that is narrated in all four Gospels. Why do you think that's so? <clears throat> Why do you think he put it in all four Gospels? Because it's important. Because there's something for us to learn from it. And it's one of the most important miracles that if we're going to observe something, we need to look at it, find out what we need to learn from it. And can I tell you that there, it, it's, um, there's quite a bit to learn from it. But uh, so let's start there in John chapter 6. Again, John chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If you want to look at it in your notes, it's there. And we're looking in the New Living Translation. In the New Living Translation, it says, after this, after what? After Jesus, after Jesus had ministered to a certain group of people, he crossed to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, which is also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw the miraculous signs as he healed the sick. So what were they seeking? They were seeking the signs. But it didn't bother Jesus because he wanted them to continue to follow him, seeing the signs, because at some point, they are, it's going to be a responsibility that they'll have to either believe or not to believe. Okay? <clears throat> so Jesus climbed a hill. So all these people are, are following him. I got something in my eyeball. Uh, get that out of there. Okay, there we go. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. So... Um, Gee, the huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw the miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed the hill and sat down with his disciples around him. So see the picture. They've crossed the sea. They've gone over to another side. He climbs up on a hill. He's trying to get away from the people. The disciples are around him. But the people are coming. So you can, you can kind of see it. You're sitting up on the hill. You're sitting there with your disciples. You can see all the people that are coming. They're, they're coming. They're coming, whether they're on boats, coming in, or they're walking. But you can begin to see them coming up there. And so it was near the time of the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw this huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip. Now, why do you suppose he turned to Philip? There were 12 disciples, right? But he turned to Philip. Why do you suppose he turned to Philip? Why didn't he turn to John? Why didn't he turn to Peter? Here's why he turned to Philip. Because this was Philip's hometown. This is where Philip lived. He was in the town that Philip lived. So he turned to Philip and he says to Philip, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? It'd be like me saying to you if I came to your town, I said, hey, where's a good restaurant to eat? Where's a good place to eat? So Jesus just turns to Philip and says, where can we buy bread? Where's Lowe's? Where's the bakery? You know what I'm saying? It was simple as that. It wasn't dramatic. It was a very simple question that he asked Philip. He said, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? And then the Bible says he was testing Philip because he already knew what he was going to do. And Philip replied, well, we could, buy bre we could buy bread at this bakery because I know Mrs. So-and-so makes baked bread over there. Did he say that? No. What did he say? He said, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to buy bread for all these people and feed them. 
So that's kind of funny because Jesus didn't ask his opinion on where the money was going to come from. Jesus asked him where he could buy bread. But Philip is a calculating man because how many know we're all calculating men? If we're men, we've got it all figured out. The wife says, hey, I'd like to do this. And all of a sudden, the, the gears are working and it's going ching 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 We have to buy this here. We'll need this. Well, I can't do that. We're going to have to hire that guy to do this. Right? Well, we can't do that, honey. <laughs> right? We're calculating men. Philip's just like us. Even if we worked for months. And it would be eight months exactly. It would be eight months wages that it would have taken to feed not just the 5,000, but the 2.5 with each man. Uh, so we're talking somewhere between 12,500 to 15,000 people that they were looking at feeding. That's a group. I mean, no, that's a big group. And so <clears throat> Philip's calculating. And Philip's calculation said no. And how many know when, when our calculations say no, but Jesus says yes, what are we supposed to do? Well, when someone's facing a challenge in their life, you've probably heard other Christians say something like this. Well, remember now, God will never let you, never give us more than you can handle. God will never give you more than you can handle. Well, let me just say that that's a lie. Because God just gave Philip more than he could handle. He just gave Philip more than he could handle on his own. So listen to me really quickly. I guess Philip didn't get that memo. Because in the very moment, Jesus gave Philip more than he could handle. Indeed, the passage said that Jesus was testing Philip. And I want you to notice that in James, the Bible says God never tests with evil. If God never tests with evil, Jesus never tests with evil. But Jesus will test you with the impossible. And when he tests you with the impossible, he, it's not impossible to him. It's only impossible to you. And so the notion that God won't give us more than we can handle, it comes from this passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Write it down, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. If you're taking notes or look at it in your Bible, it says this, God is faithful. How many believe God's faithful? It says God is faithful. God will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may endure it. So it didn't, he didn't say God wouldn't give you more than you can handle. He, this scripture says that if the devil tempts you, that he was not allowed to tempt you with more than, than God would give you the way of escape for. Do you see that? So God will never allow us to face a situation where temptation to sin is too much for us. You know what that means? That with every temptation, there is a way of escape. And so it's, we either listen to the temptation or we look for the way of escape. Come on. You're either, looking for the, you're either focusing on the temptation or you're looking for the way of escape. And sometimes you go back and forth. But the, the way of escape is always there. It's always there. Are you with me? And so 1 Corinthians 10, 13, never is, a, is it a promise that God will only give us assignments and callings we can handle in our own abilities. This does not negate the power of the giftings. He gifted us by the Holy Spirit. But even with our gifts of the Holy Spirit, what we're looking at that God's called us to do is going to be bigger than who we are and what we can handle. So listen to this. The Apostle Paul, and how many believe the Apostle Paul was a highly gifted man? He was highly gifted by God. We know that. So Paul's a highly gifted man, and he is in a situation where death was his only expectation. He thought he was going to die. Now, I don't know if you've been in that situation I've never really been in that situation. I rolled a vehicle once and I thought I was going to die, right? But I didn't, thank the Lord. That's the only time that I can even really begin to think back to where I thought I was actually going to die, right? But you may have been in a situation where you thought you were going to die. Paul was, and here's what Paul said. We stopped, 
in the midst of the situation where we thought we were going to die, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. So here's what Paul's saying. Now, Paul is very gifted, very learned, spent time with Jesus, had revelations of Jesus. Are you with me? He had visions. He went to heaven. This guy has had some gifting. And he thought he was going to die and said he had to learn to rely on God. How many know we may not be where Paul is, but we still have to learn to rely on God. And so here's what he said. We learn to rely on God who raises the dead. Yeah, you know what I hear? Here's what I hear. Paul said, I'm going to rely on God. If I die, I die. I'm going to rely on God because he raises the dead. So if I die, it's not even an issue. Because if he wants me living, he'll raise me up. Come on, somebody. We need to get excited about this relationship that we have with the God of miracles. That he has, a, he has a, an assignment for you that is going to be harder than you can do by yourself. And so you can't rely on you. You have to rely on him. And if that assignment brings you to the brink of death, so what? If I die, he'll just raise me back up. It'll be Groundhog Day all over again. <laughs> See, the devil wants to limit us. And the way he limits us is by getting us to look only at ourselves. But God wants us to rely on him. See, Philip knew the task to feed 5,000 was beyond his strength. It was beyond his abilities. It was beyond his resources. Even if, he, if he, even if he was to work for the next eight months, it would be more than he alone could handle. But Jesus wanted to meet the need in that very moment. And so Philip had a decision to make in that very moment. And fortunately, he was saved by the bell. You know what I mean? How do we know he was saved by the bell? Because the scripture says, then Andrew. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. So here's Philip. He doesn't know what to say. Andrew speaks. And Andrew says, there's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. And then he says, so there a minute you see this glimpse of faith. There's a guy here, he's got some bread and he's got some fish, a little bit of faith, but what good is that, he says. And Philip probably thought the same thing. What good would that do? But in this glimmer of faith, Andrew offered Jesus a meager resource. It was a gift. Do you know that resource was a gift? It wasn't even his own lunch. It wasn't Andrew's lunch. It was a little boy's lunch. It was a gift. The little boy said, yeah, take my lunch. And so the gift was from a young boy, and the lunch was five barley loaves and two fish. Not much for a crowd of 5,000 people, but still, Andrew offered the resource to Jesus. And what was Jesus' reaction? He was just simply looking for somebody to trust him. And so then he began to say, tell everyone to sit down. We're having lunch. Tell everyone to sit down. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered 5,000. Every test of faith, listen, every test of your faith is to see if you will respond to God's command in the midst of what's unknown. In the midst of what you don't know, will you obey? There are some things you do know and there are some things you won't know. Remember we talked about last week, God will reveal some things and conceal some things. He's revealing that I need you to trust me. I've got it, I've got it worked out. And he's concealing how he's going to work it out immediately. And he'll do that for us sometimes. That's where we just have to trust him. I was telling the folks in the earlier service, I've had a, an issue with my truck and my motor's gone out. Right? The motor's gone out of my truck. And when I first realized that, I was pretty stinking upset. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I was not a happy camper. And I was going to call GM. You know what I mean? They need to make this right. This truck's only got so many miles and it shouldn't be doing this and blah, 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 blah. And I was pretty upset and I was going to act a fool. But I was studying this message. And so I said, well, okay, let's see if it'll work. Let's put it to work. 
I'm going to calm myself down, and I'm going to trust you, God, every step of the way. I'm going to give you the resource that I have. I know a person that, I mean, I've done everything I can do with my truck. I've done all the oil changes the way that I'm supposed to do it. I've done everything the way that, that GM says I'm supposed to do it. So I'm going to go tell them, look, I've done everything. This is my resource. I've done everything I know to do. Now I need your assistance. I need somebody to help me. And God's working. And I'll give you the rest of the story later, okay? But God's working. And I'm trusting him. The reason I'll give you the rest of the story later is because it's not over yet. So this is my faith journey right now. And, I, and I'm trusting God. Amen? I'm not trusting somebody. I don't need your money, okay? This is, we're not taking an offering. I'm just saying I'm trusting God. All right? <clears throat> So uh, um, it's a meager resource, but it's a resource. Every test of faith is to see if we will respond to God's command in the midst of the unknown. Be angry and sin not. I got angry, but I can't sin. I have to trust. But Jesus' command, when he commanded them to sit down, it created an expectation. They thought they were going to see something. And so without hesitation, they did it. Then Jesus took the loaves and gave thanks to God and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish. And they all ate as much as they wanted. And so what did they do? They gathered up all the fish. And what did the people say when they saw all that? He, they said, we saw him do this miraculous sign. Surely he's the prophet we've been expecting. Now here's the thing, folks. God wants to feed a lot of people. God wants to feed a lot of people, and he needs you to help him. And we're going to have to trust him with the meager resources that we have and the understanding that we're gifted. And we're going to have to step out and do something we've never done before. I like one person said this, if you want something you've never had before, you've got to do something you've never done before. So Jesus gives us more than we can handle so that he might provide through us what we could never provide ourselves. Jesus, it's in your notes, Jesus gives us more than we can handle so that he might provide through us what we could never provide ourselves. See, we can't simply rely on our own abilities to do whatever work God has called us to do. When we do the work of ministry, our own resources will only go so far. It is when you get to the end of yourself that you'll realize that you're facing more than you can handle. You'll always face, if you're going to obey God, you'll always face more than you can handle. It is in this moment that you must turn to Jesus and offer your resources to him. And that might be the gift that he's already given you. And trust that by his power, he will fill the spiritual need right in front of you. God will use what you have in your hand to do what you could never do on your own. So three things and we're going to close. Number one, God never leaves us alone in his work. He never leaves us alone in his work. In the teaching about ordering our lives, we've taught this before to you, that there are things you need to say no to. But how many know that um, when it comes to the opportunities to serve in the areas you believe God is calling you, instead of assuming it is more than you can handle, have courage to say yes to the things to which God has called you. Say yes to the things to which God has called you. I'm going to leave that right there. I want you to meditate that. In the midst of our opportunities, God may be testing you. Will you use and develop the gifts of service he's given you? Or will you give in to anxiety and fear? Using your gifts and giving your best effort, when you do that, the truth remains is that you still can't handle everything. But saying yes to using your gifts to deliver, to deliver God's word in faith that by his power God will meet the spiritual need setting before you, you're going to find that miracles follow when you agree to serve. When you agree to serve, when I agree to serve, when I agree that, you know what, it may be bigger than me, but I don't care, I'm going to go do it. It may be bigger than me to walk across the, the, the restaurant. We did this the other night. Dana did this. Walked across the restaurant the other night and talked to an individual that she had never met, inviting them to something. It took her out of her comfort zone. But it, it, it um, um, took advantage 
of the giftings that are already on the inside of her. And these people, they, they joined us last night in a thing that we went to for ministry purposes. And, and man, they were a great blessing. And they're going to be a great blessing to this ministry. All because she was willing just to use the gift that God had already gifted her with. It wasn't anything new, but it was out of your comfort zone, wasn't it? And so we're going to have, it, it seems like we can't handle it, but if we'll step out, God will use us. Miracles follow when we agree to serve. If you'll come to the um, music, let me say this, Acts chapter 8. Remember Philip in his own hometown told Jesus, we can't do this. He looked at Jesus and basically said, I've calculated it, Jesus. This is impossible. Right? How many of you have ever said that to God? Nobody raising their hands, are they? I've said it. This can't work, God. I don't know how this is going to work out. I've said that about a, 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 a couple of things in my life, and I cannot believe how God worked it out. But I had to trust him. Here's the same Philip in Acts chapter 8, verse 5 and 8. Philip, for example, the writer, Luke, is talking about Philip. And using Philip, the guy right here, remember we always talk about Peter and, you know, Peter denied Christ three times, but later on preached on the day of Pentecost. Well, here's Philip. He's telling Jesus, no, we can't do this. We can't go reach the lost is basically what he's telling him. We can't feed 5,000. How many believe we can feed 5,000? How many believe we can feed 10,000? We can feed 15,000? I believe that. Why? Because God's with us. And when it's you and God, you're a majority. And so Philip, for example, went to the city of Samaria, a place that was not Jewish, and he was Jewish. Philip went to a, a, the city of Samaria, and what did he do? He told people there about the Messiah. What did he do? He went in all the world and preached the gospel. So what happened? What happened when he did what God told him to do? Because at first he wasn't having it, right? How many know what I'm talking about? In the, in the, he, he wasn't having it. We're not feeding these people. And now Jesus tells him, go. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. So what does he do? He goes to Samaria. People, when they travel, they tried to go around Samaria. It was not a place that you wanted to go to. But he went to it. He went to Samaria and told the people about the Messiah. And the crowds listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear his message and see the miraculous signs he did. How did he do them? God did them through him by the power of the Holy Spirit, using the giftings that God had already gifted, uh, gifted Philip with that he didn't even know he had. Many evil spirits were cast out. What are you going to do? You're going to cast out devils. Many evil spirits were cast out. They were screaming as they left their victims. Don't you love that the Bible gives us the little detail? How did demons leave? Screaming. And many who had been paralyzed or lamed, you lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And many who had been paralyzed and were lamed were healed. So there was great joy in the city. I want you to thank God that today he is the same God. He's the God of miracles. He's the God of wonders. He's still demonstrating his awesome power. And see, if you'll, if you'll make provision of your gift and your meager provision, and you allow God to use it, miracles will follow you because you're preaching the word of God. Would you stand with me today? I'm going to ask our prayer team to come down. Prayer team members, if you'll come down. Amen. Here's the thing, folks. There's stuff going on in your life. You might need a miracle. Can I tell you, these are believers right here. These people that are going to be down here are believers. And the Bible says that believers can lay their hands on you and you'll be made well. If you'll believe too. you got to believe too. Remember, Jesus went to his own hometown and he could there do no mighty work. Why? Because they all just saw Debbie Gilmore. They saw Debbie Gilmore and they said, well, Debbie Gilmore, she's not God. You know what I'm saying? We've known her. She's come to this church all of her life. Almost. All the life of the church. She's been here all this time. It's just get Debbie Gilmore. What, what can she do? She can't do anything but obey God. And you know that's enough? Because if she'll obey God and pray for you, God will show up when she lays her hands on you. 
that the healing power of God will come upon you and it'll drive out sickness and disease. So if you're sick, you need to come see Debbie right now because Debbie will pray for you. Amen. We have a friend here, right here. Anybody know this guy? He can pray. He can pray. But if you come up here looking at him, you're going to miss your healing. You're going to miss your blessing. You're going to miss God working in your life. But if you have a situation in your life, I'm just sensing right now, if you've got a situation, financial situation in your life, that you don't know what you're going to do, you don't know what to do, Take the meager resource you have and let's take it to God and let's bless it. Let's bless it right now. So if you're in here and you've got a financial resource, let this guy right here pray for you. Because he's had those situations, right? And God's blessed you in those situations. Amen. I'm serious. If you have a need, come down right now. If you have a need of prayer, come down right now. Don't wait. I'm going to let these guys, I'm going to have, come on right now. If you have a need for prayer, come on right now. But I'm going to have these folks uh, sing right now. They're going to sing this song. I want you to sing and begin to worship God. Hallelujah. We're so glad that you've been with us today. <clears throat> if you have not accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, today's your day. You can do that. And here's what we're going to do is we're going to pray a prayer. And if you want to accept Christ, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me from your heart. Now, it seems kind of interesting because you don't know what I'm getting ready to say. But I'm going to lead you in a prayer that will cause you to have a relationship with Christ. And I'm going to ask each and every person to pray that prayer with me. Say, Father God, say, Father God, I thank you that you sent Jesus to die for me. And I believe that you raised him from the dead, seated him at your own right hand. I believe that he's my Lord. So I confess with my mouth today, Jesus, you are my Lord. You are my Savior. And you said if I would confess with my mouth, believe with my heart, that I would be saved. Today I receive Christ, and today I am saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Let's give the Lord a big hand. I'm going to turn this over to um, Hannah. She's going to close in prayer. And... Uh, She's going to pray us out. But man, God bless you guys. Thank you for staying hooked up with me in this sermon today. I just believe that the, the, the Word of God can change our life. And I expect to hear good reports about people going into all the world and preaching the gospel. Amen.
morning, church. Let me pray for you this morning. Lord, I just pray over each and every person that is here today. Lord, we thank you for the word that you've given us. We thank you for the challenge to rise up in, in the gifts that you have called us, Lord, and the things and the places that you've called us to do, go. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit, the boldness inside of them would well up and over as they leave this place. Let us go and speak of the goodness of God. We give you all the praise this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, you are dismissed. We look forward to seeing you.